and be, just become, uh, get outside of our box and, and reach people for Jesus. Amen? Amen. So uh, I guess giving our, our, our official living word welcome to <laughs> Pastor Jake Henriel. Because every time I call someone, I'll be like, oh, this is Jake from the church, or Jake from like, it's, that commercial has done me wrong, 100%. I don't mean to avoid you, I'll just have to think about you guys over here and, and do that. <clears throat> uh, let's pray real quick and we'll get started. Father God, we love you. <clears throat> Father, we're so grateful for your faithfulness and your patience and grace. Father, give me the words to say. Father, give us a teachable spirit, but also the boldness to live out what you're teaching us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. amen. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? Three people. It's better than zero, so it's <laughs> 100%. First question I have, because how you answer this question will dictate a lot. Are you truly in love with Jesus Christ. Truly. Not, not just I love him, like how I love a good double cheeseburger, right? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Or Panda Express, the orange flavored chicken is off the hook, okay? But are you truly in love with Jesus Christ? Because that defines your walk. That motivates it defines it. Because if you're not in love with Jesus, it's really hard to submit and trust to God. Now, I'm not saying you have to have that perfect love, but are you in love? Does he capture your mind when you wake up? See, is he the last thing you think about when you go to bed? I'll be honest. I try. It doesn't happen all the time. And I kick myself. Because how do I think about, like, pizza before I go to bed? Like, you know what I mean? Or is my Niners going to beat the Cardinals? And they did not. That is so humbling that we lost to the Cardinals. <laughs> humbling, capital H, humbled, all the way through. Okay? He said get used to it. <laughs> I was debating on should I comment or not, and I did, no blame. <laughs> so are you truly in love with Jesus? And as a follower of Christ, I really, the second question is dear to my heart, because if you do not have a heart for this, you're missing out. You're missing the, the mark. You have a heart for the lost. Do you cry for the broken? Do you weep for them? Not, not just for family members or friends that you know personally, but when you drive by and you see people out there, you don't know their story, so we can't assume if they're a believer or not, but if they are a lost soul, Scripture is very clear on where they go. Separation from God for eternity. I venture to say and we're going to talk about this a little bit today. The battle of the seas. Comfort versus Christ. Because here's the issue. I think most Americans look at this, the Bible. Whose word is this? God's. Okay? And if we believe this is God's word, I think a lot of us struggle by looking at this through the American lens. We look at it through our culture. Because there's a lot of Christianity, I call it the American Christianity, that does not look the same when I'm overseas in a third world country. 
Because at the end of the day, people will pick their comfort over Christ. That's just the bottom line. I've met so many people in life. How come you don't want to go talk to someone? Oh, I'm shy. Oh, what if they reject me? What am I supposed to say? Hi. I'm Jake. You know what I mean? From State Farm. <laughs> no. <laughs> I might claim that not living word if that keeps coming up. I'm Jake from State Farm. No, I'm playing. <laughs> Forgive me if I have to go back and forth with my humbling glasses. The older I get, my eyes. Carrots don't work. That's a lie. Okay. Carrots do not strengthen your eyesight. Okay. But I want to start with this. I did not know what to title this message. If I should call all saved, none perish, or the great commission, or the great omission. So my life verse is this, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is my life verse. At the end of the day, I don't exist no more. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So I don't want people to see Jake. I want them to see Jesus. Okay? Because at the end of the day, if you live for 70 years, 90 years, it's just a breath. What are we doing for eternity? I can't exist And I think a lot of times we get in the way of God. We forget as a believer slash follower of Jesus Christ, we step aside. As a follower, we don't tell Jesus, come follow me. I got you. I got a great game plan. Right? You know what I'm saying? Come on, Jesus. You're slower than the sheep. Let's go. Whoa. Really? We're supposed to follow Jesus Christ. I no longer live. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me daily. Souls are at stake. And unfortunately, American Christianity is failing at saving souls and discipling them the correct way. Because we preach comfort. We preach the I gospel. It has to be you-centered. It's about me. It's about Jake. So I agree with this, some of the scriptures, but God, you, you tripping. <laughs> that doesn't apply to me. No, nah, dude. I'll just skip over that one. No one saw. Yeah, we make it about me. We have been accused of having radical faith before, my family and I. And, I, and my response was, it's not radical, it's biblical. And, but because no one does it biblically, that's why it looks radical. It's not radical to live in faith. It's not radical to have a marriage that communicates together and stuff. It's not radical to pray for your kids. It's not radical to follow the Lord. It's a biblical. It's not radical to forgive someone. It's not radical to love a stranger or your enemy. It's biblical. So why in America are we being accused of having radical faith if we're living biblical truths? Because we have presented a watered-down gospel. Every one of you is called to the Great Commission. We're going to get to that in a second. Everyone. It's not the pastors. It's not the missionaries. It's not the lay leaders. Everybody is called to be part of the Great Commission. I got 12 pages here. And I got like 20-something minutes. So some of this might be fast forward. You know what I mean? Next. I also wanted, this is my opinion. Preaching is to convict, and teaching is to inform. I'm not here to inform you. Uh, Through the Spirit, I'm here to convict you today. Okay? 
And I'm also here to tell you, conviction demands application. There's no point in having a conviction if you're not going to do nothing about it. Okay? My wife wanted me to share this, so I'll just put it out there. Two something years ago, I was at 515 pounds. Okay? Don't know how I got there. I was athletic, sports, this and that. I always blame marriage, but it's not fair to put that on my wife. Right? Okay? Because I never had three meals a day until I got married. Right? It was a struggle. Okay? But I'm in my 300s now, two years later, working on this. So does it matter if my wife goes, I love you, Jake, but you got to change, right? Woo, right? Or if my doctor says, man, if you don't get this under control, you might not live till pa- past 50. I can agree with them. Dude, I see it. I'm, I'm big. But if I don't do something about it, it doesn't matter if I feel like doing something about it or if I agree I should do something about it. Am I doing something about it? Are you leading people to Christ? Are you discipling? Or you love your little comfort? Do you love your little rascals club? I call it the tree club society. Got to know the right handshake to get in. There's no reason for our church not to be growing. None. I see plenty of soldiers in here for Christ. And I see plenty of people outside these walls that need Christ in the church. Christ first, then a church. No reason. So preaching is to convict, teaching is to form. That's why we have Bible study, small groups, Sunday school, things like that. <clears throat> I believe life is all about relationships. Ours with God and then ours with others. I believe life is all about the soul of a person. I also believe God is not only about salvation, but also transformation. You look at the Great Commission, I also believe, and we'll get to that in a second, that God words things in order for a certain reason. And so if you break down the Great Commission, there's three points. Go, baptize, then teach. There's a progression. Teach them what? And you wouldn't know the Great Commission offhand? What are we supposed to teach them? About Jesus, about Jesus' teachings, right? Not about, I'm not trying to raise Jacobites. Right? I'm not trying to push an agenda of, of a certain denomination. It says, teach them my ways. So there's a progression. So it's, it's evident that it's not just about salvation, but it's also transformation. So the first question I have for us, or actually third now, right? Why did God create you? Why? Was it just to have a, a temporary relationship with you or an um, a, um, in-and-out relationship or visitation type of relationship? Like, I got you on Sundays, and I got you on Wednesdays for the midweek service. But that are five days, you can do whatever you want, right? Why did he create us? According to Scripture, for his pleasure, your life is God's if you like it or not. First, if you accept him or reject him, you didn't create it. We were created for his pleasure. And he created us because he wanted to, not because he had to. He didn't need us. He was in perfect harmony with the Trinity. He went with, with no need. He wanted us. He gave us free will. Who here wants to be loved because you were ordered to or had to love someone? No. Right? So Revelations 4.11, ESV. You are worthy. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things by your will. They exist and were created. Colossians 1.16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. In Genesis 1, 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. We as humans have the ability to know God 
And therefore to love him, worship him, serve him, and fellowship with him. Your choice. This whole concept of having that relationship. And if you're the one that says you're in love with Jesus Christ, but your schedule shows I only spend like five minutes a week with him, you ain't in love with him. Sorry. I'm sorry. I love my wife, Alicia. She only gets 10 minutes a week with me. (laughs) Right? That doesn't show like love or loyalty or commitment. Oh, wait, wait, you want to go to the movies, babe? Sorry, I'm really busy. Let me look at my schedule. Like, Jesus, I know you're calling me to talk to that person to see if they're saved or not, but they're scary looking. They're homeless. How quick we are to judge. And trust me, I've been profiled my whole life. Because I look like a thug with my hat backwards, my tattoos and everything. I still get profiled as a fat, chubby 47-year-old. You kidding me? The only way I get away from a cop is if I roll. Like, yeah, I'm not running. Like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Come on now. You're profiled me for what? Like, and back then I'm driving like this beat-up minivan. Yeah, I'm a drug dealer over here. Look at this little, like, man. Anywho. Sorry, I lost my spot. (laughs) Growing up, my mom and I, we would disagree on things. Then the argument would turn into who just got the final word. Had nothing to do with what you were arguing now. So I go to my room. I'm like, whatever, mom. Close the door. She opened up. You're dumb. Close the door. (laughs) I open the door. Well, you can't cook. Right? Like, it was just whoever got the final word. Had nothing to do with the disagreement no more. So as a Christian... Who is your final word? Your feelings? Your emotions? Your family? Your culture? Your church? Or the Bible? And if it is the Bible, then step up and then start living it out. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is truly our final word. This truly says to forgive, to heal, to love, to sacrifice, show grace to the broken. Why are we not doing it? Because I know there's people in this room that have unforgiveness in their heart. For a fact. I know there's people in here that has resentment. That they're holding on to something that happened years ago. Because we can't let it go or forgive, maybe we're, we have to forgive ourselves. It affects the relationships and your walk with God today. It's very easy to say this is God's word. But it's a lot different to walk it out. True conviction demands application. And we live in a world that's starting to get very questionable. America has changed. My opinion, the 80s and 90s were the best times. Right? If you don't like the Goonies, you're not American. Yeah. Yep. Hello, you guys. I got you. Goonies. Bueller. Bueller. Yeah. I also want to talk about the word real quick before we get to the main stuff. Like, I like deli sandwiches, right? But you have to have the good bread before you get to the meat, right? So, the Bible is described a few different ways. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So the Bible is like a sword. Jeremiah 23, 29. God compares his word with fire and with a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. Nothing can withstand the power of the word of God. So a hammer and fire, and also in Hebrews it says it's active and alive. The word of God is not a cuddle buddy. It's active. It's a hammer. It's a sword. It's a fire. It's alive. Also, the word of God is truth. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. John 17, 17. Proverbs 35. Every word of God is flawless, 
He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Psalms 12, 6, and the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purifying in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture, not some, or the ones I agree, or the ones that make me feel happy, all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good word. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Make no mistake, Jesus Christ is God. Amen. And then the Bible talks about four types of loves, right? You got the philia, the friendship, the homey, close friend, brotherly love. We do secret like little handshakes and pump it or fist pump and all that. The brotherly love. Then the storage, storage. I don't know how to pronounce that, my bad. Family love, love between family members. Then the eros, eros, that's that romantic type of love. The one I want to look at today while we go through the Great Commission is agape. Unconditional, sacrificial, no strings attached. Who here loves with strings attached? I mean, I will only live for God. God, if you do this for me, I promise you I'll do that. Oh, I, pro I will never drink again. Blech. Just help me get through this. Next day we're back doing what we said we wouldn't. How many times have we made a deal with God with strings attached? Or how many times have we gone in our prayer or in our mind saying, I'll forgive that person once they ask for forgiveness first. A lot of us are string attachers. We love unconditionally. And for me, as a human, it's impossible. But with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, it's possible. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified. I can't love people the way the Bible tells me to love unless the Holy Spirit's in me. I can't. And I will tell you online and here publicly, if I didn't have Jesus Christ, I would not love none of you. Zero. I still be in California with my La Familia, my clique, my homies, and true family. That little area would be the only people I would care about. I'm being honest. I can't love the way this tells me to love without Jesus Christ. I can't. And a lot of us walk the walk without the power. A lot of us walk the walk without having a true relationship with Jesus. And then we get burned out or discouraged or disappointed. You got to put the time into it if you want a strong relationship. And the beautiful thing about Christ is he's not going to force you. Wake up. Get over here. You're going to love me. If you like it or not. No. Well, you know what, Jake? Before I get on the cross and take all that, you got to get skinnier because the gate's not that wide, <laughs> right? There's no strings attached. He died. He loved. Amen. He died for us while we we're still sinners. Yes. He died for us knowing that some of us will still reject him, that some of us will still claim the name of Christ. But, you know, in all reality, you're just a carnal Christian. You live in the flesh. Two greatest commandments is to love who first? Let's not whisper it. Who? God. Woo! Jesus, right? Like it's God. Then the second greatest commandment is to love who? Your others. Ten commandments. First four focuses on your relationship with God. The last six focuses on your relationship with others. Love God. Love people.
You find that in Matthew chapter 22. Also, Christians, we also have to grasp this because I've been to a lot of funerals in my life where when it becomes personal, we kind of change our mind on things. Personal never trumps biblical. According to John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way to the Father. And if there's only one way to the Father, that's why the Great Commission is so much more important. If there was multiple rivers that led to the same ocean, I get why Christians here do what they do. But if there's truly only one river that gets to the ocean, there's truly only one way to get with uh, uh, the Father in heaven, why are we bench warmers? Do we not really believe in heaven and hell? Because that's a real reality. Do you really love the lost, even if you don't know them? Are you willing to step out of your comfort zone to tell them about Jesus or ask them if they know Jesus? And if they say no or no thank you, you've done your part. Wipe your sandals and move on. According to statistics, there's a lot of people in the Phoenix area that don't know Jesus. So, Great Commission reads this. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When he saw him, when they, sorry, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority, all? Yeah, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I did some research. Omission can be considered a sin, biblically. A sin of omission is when someone willingly fails to do, to do what they know is right. James 4, 17, ESV. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, he, it is sin. So again, I, read, I said this earlier. Sins of omission. Here's some examples. Failing to forgive, love, honor, or trust God. If you don't trust God, sin of omission. The Bible says to trust them. Statistics I found with the great omission, not commission, omission. 61% of Christians have never shared their faith. Yeah, because there's a lot of times where, you know, you preach the gospel at all times, but speak when necessary. I could live it out, but they don't know me personally. Like, for example, I have family members that are awesome parents, awesome spouses, and they act more like a Christian than I do, and they're not even a believer. So because you can act the part or, or behave or, and be good or be respectful doesn't classify you as a Christian. So how do they know what I believe in if I don't take the time to step out? Ninety-eight percent of Christians don't witness to a non-believer weekly. Ninety-five percent of Christians have never led someone to God. I learned this a long time ago. Obedience requires no understanding. God said, "You're moving your family from Missouri to Arizona." All right. I didn't slam my foot down. And say, "You tell, tell you tell me why we're going. I ain't going." You know how hot that place is? I'm going to Cardinal country. And I'm a Niner fan. You know what I'm saying? The 49ers, 1%. Yes. I know I got some support, but I won't put them on, on blast. I don't want them to get hated on too. I'll take all the hate, all the heat. Right? Okay. 
John 14, uh, 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my? Yep, other translation says, if you love me, you will obey me. Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord? Lord, and do not do what I tell you. Why do you say I'm the Lord of your life, but yet you don't listen to what I say? Don't get me wrong. It's all about love and grace. 100%. I'm saved by grace, and I know that. And I'm the last person to throw a stone. But because Christ is all about love and grace, does not mean that you get a justification to your disobedience. If you're a parent and your kids know you love them, does, that doesn't like, give them the right to go, oh, my mom and dad love me. So I can break all the rules. <laughs> I don't have to listen to my mom or dad because they have to love me. <laughs> Are you kidding me? My wife made a vow, but I could look elsewhere now. <laughs> she said she'll love me no matter what. Don't we live like that sometimes with our faith? You say I'm your Lord, but you don't listen to me. I just told you to go talk to that homeless person, and you said, no, no, I have a nail appointment I got to get to. I got to look good. Because my Christianity is about my appearance. Not what's really going on inside me. I once had someone ask me during a pastor's um, interview to see if they're going to hire me or not. True story. Sitting there with like 16 other people. And she asked me this. Jake, have you ever been turned down a, a, of a job because you're fat? Right? Love the honesty or whatever. And I looked at her and I said, the difference between you and I is mine's visible. Yours is invisible. We all have something to work on. The Great Commission should be the heartbeat of every believer. The, one of the purposes of the church should be the Great Commission. If your church is not down for the Great Commission, that's not one of the pillars of your church, get out. Your church has to be about soul winning. It has to. Many churches are more focused about their procedures, programs, politics, policies, versus the Great Commission. Commission means, in the Webster, the authorization of, of a command to act in a prescribed manner. It is a commandment. Also, the Great Commission is a mandate. Mandate, like how this one guy named Larry Stockstill, the book's called The Surge, Conviction is something we would die for in order to protect it. But a mandate is something we would die for in order to advance it. In other words, a conviction is a firm belief. A mandate is an official order to do something. Oh, that's like the, I hear the. I'm only on page seven. I got the oh. Oh, how many seconds do I have? Okay. <laughs> I can't get all that in one second. I got three timeouts, right? <laughs> so, again, Second Peter 3 through 9. Sorry, chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. 1 Timothy 2, 4. Who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? The heartbeat of God is that all are saved, none perish. <clears throat> is that your heartbeat today? Or is it about your comforts? Are you going to leave this room today going, man, that was a great message. He was kind of funny. Well, I've never met a chubby person that wasn't funny, to be honest. Like, that's just one of the traits. Big people are funny. It's true. You, you got me, right? It's true. It's true. It's true. Like, big people are just funny. Okay? Come on now. Chris Farley, Jack Black, John Candy, John Goodman. 
right? But because of time's sake, man, the good stuff is coming up now. I tried to, mm, I got six more pages. Part two, I guess. Um, part two will consist of the five key points to the Great Commission, then seven key points of why we don't do the Great Commission. Well, before we, we close the service, I'll make sure for, do we do the most important thing we can do today, and that is give you an opportunity to receive Christ. I look around the room, I go, oh, yeah, a lot of familiar faces, but I don't ever want to assume where everybody is with Christ. So we're going to pray this prayer. It tells us in Romans 10 how we receive the gift of salvation. We acknowledge as a gift, right, that that's all by grace. That's all Jesus. You have nothing to do with it except making a decision to receive it. So it tells us that we speak with our mouths who Jesus is. That's what we'll do with this prayer. The only other thing that you're required to do is to believe what you're saying is true. Right? It's not just words you're reciting. Reciting words doesn't change you. But believing the, those words, that's what will change you. So let's pray this prayer together. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. And I ask you, dear Jesus, to come into my life, come into my heart, to be my Lord and my Savior. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for me, and he rose again, and I thank him for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that for the very first time, or maybe you recommitted your life to the Lord, there's two things I want to encourage you to do. The first is to please tell someone you made that decision. Uh, Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my Father who is in heaven. So it's an important step to tell someone. If you're here in our building, I can guarantee there's not another person who's here that wouldn't be really excited to hear about that. If you're online today, please send us a message. You know, DM us or what, I'm not even going to try to use the terminology because my kids will just roll their eyes at me. But tell us somehow online on the, on the interweb thing. Uh, and, and, uh, but if you don't tell us, please tell somebody. The second thing that's important, uh, get plugged into a church, right? That, that you need it in your life, not because it's a rule or a law or God loves you more because you go to church or that's what you got to do to make them happy or anything like that. I believe God established a church because he knows how much we need it, that we need family. We need people that are going the same direction we're trying to go, people that are there to, to pray for us and love us and support us, and that we pray for and we love and we support. We need that. And that and as, as, uh, as we shared with us this morning, that, that we're also always continuing to help expand that, bring that same thing to other people. Amen? Amen. So with that, I'll have Pastor Tammy come and close our service. Amen. Praise the Lord, family. Good word. You need to chew on that all week. Amen. Ladies, I want to encourage you that this Wednesday morning, our founding pastor, Dr. Maureen Anderson, is coming to speak to the Wednesday morning ladies. So bring a friend, come early, get a good seat. We're planning on a lot of women here this Wednesday at 10 a.m. And we're going to have a great time listening to Dr. Maureen and gleaning all her wisdom. Amen. Um, the Volunteer Appreciation Dinner is just a couple weeks away. It is Friday night, October 25th at 6.30 p.m. There will be an RSVP link in your weekly email. We don't ha hand out paper bulletins. You get a weekly email. If you're not getting that email, make sure we have your correct email address at the info counter. It'll be coming out on Wednesday this week, so look for it. An RSVP for that dinner so we can have a good count. Hopefully, it'll be cooler by then so we can actually enjoy a good chili and cornbread dinner. Is catered by Kings and Priests Catering that night. And then, uh, ladies, my Christmas tea hostess sign-up is open. So if you would like to host us, um, all we're asking hostesses to do is to decorate and bring dessert because we are having a catered event. This time for the tea is going to be Bama Barbecue. It is the only thing from Alabama I allow during football season. And so it is really worth it it's so good so uh the christmas tea is december 13th so ladies if you can host us please sign up with trinity at the info counter stand with me as i close in prayer don't forget pastor jeff's midweek service you join on the stream at 7 and then on zoom at 7 30 and all that is also in the weekly email let's go ahead and pray father thank you for today thank you for bringing us all together to listen to your word to hear it receive it 
let it get down deep in us and grow and produce fruit to your glory, God. I pray blessing on my church family as we go. I thank you that your face shines on us, that grace abounds to us, and that you give us peace. Thank you that every day, as soon as we wake up, we say, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. Have a great week.